Welcome to our session today, Failing Forward, Risk-Taking and the Benefits of Failure. I'm uh, Kanye Lomo, a media entrepreneur. I'm the founder and CEO of Ndalo Media. With <laughs> Thank you. And uh, I'm delighted to be sharing the stage today with uh, fellow African entrepreneurs. Um, and I'll begin uh, from the outside with Patrick Awa, who's the founder and president of Ashesi University. I'm not going to go into the profile. <laughs> because um, each panelist will share. <laughs> That's a political There's a statement. very enthusiastic yeah. welcome there from <laughs> your fan, fellow Ghanaians. Um, each panelist will share their story and their background. Um, Bina Maseno in the middle is the founder of Badili Africa and Jason Joku. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Founder and CEO of uh, Iroko. I gather there are no Kenyans then in the audience because uh, Bina didn't get uh, a patriotic shout. So let's just stand back there. <laughs> there we go. That's more like it. So we'll be talking about the, the idea of um, dreaming big, daring to go the path less traveled. And naturally, along that journey, there are challenges. Uh, that one meets up with um, and that one has to overcome and, and rise above. So what we're going to do is just share a little bit about our stories. I'm not going to dwell too much on my own story because the focus is on our panelists. I'm, I'm the moderator. But I think what I have learned from my entrepreneurship journey is that entrepreneurship is not so much about the goal uh, and not so much about the business that one wants to launch. Uh, it's so much more about the character that you develop along the way. Um, and I think each one of the challenges that we face along the way is really an exercise in character development and almost preparing the character for that giant big goal, whether it's entrepreneurship, whether it's political office, whether it's um, some kind of non-profit venture that's designed to positively impact the world. It's really how those challenges prepare your character to, to carry and um, truly serve uh, this big dream. But I won't dwell too much on that because I know that, Bina, you've got some interesting insights um, on the entrepreneurship journey, yours in particular, and some of the challenges you faced along the way. Oh, so I'll tell my story. Please do, please share your story. Hi, everyone. How are you? Give your neighbor a high five for me. <laughs> your neighbor, like a high five. Look at this. Gosh. Okay, fine. So I love sharing stories. So um, I'll just share a story that we can discuss later at the panel uh, about, my, about my journey and uh, starting Badili and what I currently do. So um, I was such a young girl when, during the tail end of President Moy's regime in Kenya, and I remember growing up hearing horrific stories. You know, my dad and his friends and a few relatives, most of the time when they're having an argument, at times they're talking whispers afraid that if someone is dropped on the conversation that they would disappear, or worse still, be jailed. They told stories, they told me stories of extrajudicial detention of critics, suppression of the media, and worse, it was the use of security agents to silence critics within his own party. And the people who surrounded the president were equally powerful and feared in the same breath. And so I grew up fearing politicians a lot. I grew up knowing that you could not oppose a politician. You could not speak against what a politician wanted. And so it came as a big shocker to my own parents when they learned that I was running for a political seat years down the line. And so on this particular day, as I walked into the polling station with bated breath, 
to listen to them announce the results of who was going to become the next member of county assembly in Embakasi Central, Nairobi. I was just praying that it would make sense and that I would win the seat because the stakes were so high. And as I sat there with my coat, afraid that someone would hear my heart pounding, um, with each announcement of each result, my heart would literally stop. I thought of, I thought of the sleepless nights. I thought of the resources. And worse, it's the time that is spent campaigning that you will never recover. And I thought of having to take a whole year break out of school just to run for a seat. I thought about my dad while I was seated there just listening to the results. And my dad, like my relatives, believed that this was not an arena for women because he would often ask me questions like, Bina, so do you know any young girl who's won a seat? And I didn't know any at the time. And then I thought about my mom. And my mom thought it was quite disrespectful that you should put school on hold and you're being supported to even be in school in the first place just to run for a political seat. And then I thought about my grandmother. <laughs> I love my grandmother. My grandmother knew I had blown up all my chances of ever getting married because the idea of a woman running for political seats just made her unattractive to apparently good Christian men. And then I thought about this guy I had a crush on. And, and you know, it, as in, it had gotten too busy to even show up for dates. But then on this particular evening, I was just worried that he'd met someone else and so the stakes were high for me. I had, like, I, had to win. I had to win the seat. The stakes were too high for me. I thought about the challenges as well. And I thought of this evening when I got to, when I finished talking to some few, you know, to, to, to a crowd in a particular building in my community and there was commotion when I was trying to step out and someone literally tried to pull my skirt. But then, that was even a fair experience. Uh, but then, that was even a fair experience. When I think about the older electorate, that was so hard for me to navigate, very hard for me to navigate, because unlike the young guys would ask you for money or for goodies, these guys didn't want anything from you. They just wanted you to outline what's your vision, what are you going to do, how are you going to change things, do you understand the system, do you understand what people go through? And this group of older men, one of them just stood up and asked me, Bina, um, and not to judge you, but sadly so, at our age, we judge a young woman, but how well she's able to raise her family. We've not seen your family. We are gonna be your bigger family. How confident can we be that you're going to take care of us? And I was startled for a minute. And I just told him, I just told him, you're right. You're like my dad. You're so right. You are like my dad. And like any parent, when you're, at, when you're at home, it's your kids that you send to the kitchen. It's your kids that you send around to run errands for you. I'm just asking you to send me to parliament with your needs. I ran for this seat because I was tired of complaining. I was tired of majority of the women in my community who are small scale traders, who act a living out of washing other people's laundry, selling groceries by the roadside, selling their goodies by the roadside. And my mother, my mother was one of them. I was tired of the young girls. I'd be told their stories anytime I'd go to a high school or a, or a primary school in my community who were dropping out of school because of early pregnancy. And I just worried that if they didn't get an opportunity to go back to school, to learn all they need to, so that they could lift themselves out of poverty, what would happen to them? I was tired of all the hopelessness I would read in the faces of young people. I would see each and every day as I went to campus. And I knew that is the same fate that awaited me once I was done with campus. And that if we did not do something, about this demographic dividend, 
of young people below 35 years of age who are qualified, who are capable, but do not have any meaning, meaningful work to engage in, that if we did not tackle that demographic dividend, it would turn into a demographic disaster. I was worried and heartbroken when I heard that two of my friends who I grew up with were shot dead, only for me to learn later that they were in the list of the most wanted criminals. And I worried what would happen to their wives because one of them, I mean, his wife was also a good friend of mine because, I mean, we grew up together in the community. And I thought that winning this seat would help me create or make a small difference. And so by now they had finished announcing results from all the polling stations. And I was not leading in any of them. And I remember walking out of the polling station, I was deaf to all the congratulatory messages. I was blind to all the texts people were sending saying, you know what, that was, that was, you know, that was cool because you're battling against 12 people, so you are number four. I mean, that was quite something. I did not want to listen to any of it because it didn't matter. If you're not number one, then what difference are you going to make? So it didn't matter whether I was number two, whether I was number three, whether I was number five. It did not matter to me. What would I tell the person and the people who were supporting my education if, I'm, if, I, if I could have made it to be number one? That could have been something. So it didn't even if I was number two, it didn't matter to me. And when I got to the house, I just fell, uh, I fell, I fell on my bed and I cried my heart out. And for the next one month, tears became my food. I would not leave my bed because I could not believe all those people who are saying they're supporting you. And I just kept asking myself, how could they not see my sincerity? Because I have grown up in this community. I've been schooled in this community. How could they not see my sincerity? All those groups I visited, all those self-help groups my mother goes to, I mean, all the kids we studied with, all those sports groups that I would visit, how could they not see my sincerity? And so that continued. I fell into depression. I didn't know how I would write back to the person supporting my education to say, you know what, I just want to go back to school because um, I took a break and uh, he knew I took a break. Even the, the wife knew, my uncle knew because there were no reports to send back to them for a whole year. And so um, on this particular morning, I had routine mentorship you know, checkup and I didn't feel like leaving my bed and I just had to leave out of respect for my mentor. And I remember sitting down with my mentor, I remember sitting down, I remember sitting down with my mentor, and we went through my plans, and I think my mentor knew not to ask me about how I felt, about, and not to discuss politics precisely. And I remember him asking me, so Bina, is this the only way out? Like, is this your way out? So if you don't get these political seats, we are not gonna go ahead with our plans. So put down for me the things you wanted to do. Let's think through this plan. And as I, as I began listening to him, it's like a light bulb went on on my mind. And I began telling myself, we are actually 50 million of us in Kenya. And there is no Kenya, but just 50 million of us. And if you can change one person's understanding of how powerful a change agent they can be. If we can begin having impact on each other, more than money, more than titles, then I think we'll have changed the whole thing about leadership. And that is the day Badili Africa was born, an initiative that empowers young people to be active participants in matters governance and aims to change young women's perspective on politics. I. I realized that activism is not a reserve of a particular set of people, but that it's something we should all engage in, that every day we are seeing consequences of silence around us manifest themselves in terms of violence, rape, tribalism. And I made a commitment to myself that I will not let silence wrap itself around me that I will not allow someone else to remind me, we are the world, we are the children. I'll not allow anybody to remind me that, that I will create in me a hunger to build bridges of understanding 
beyond race, beyond gender, beyond sexual orientation or religious ideology, with people who don't think like me, who don't look like me, because all of us have the same equal value. It doesn't mean we agree, but that we are all family, that the most important office is not the office of the governor, it's not the office of the president, it's not the office of the women representative, it's not the office of the member of county assembly, that the most important office is the office of the citizen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Debina, for that uh, powerful introduction to, to our panel discussion. We'll be coming back to Bina with uh, some questions, and of course, uh, we'll open up to, to you, the audience, as well, um, after we've um, had our discussion. Um, Jason, could you please share with us your story, your journey with um, Iroko? So where do I start? Well, firstly, <laughs> I, I guess another round of applause for Bina. I think that was really powerful. Um, so everything I was about to say now is really shallow and simple compared to that powerful, engaging, but let me talk, Sha. Well, um, <laughs> achievement. So. Of course, no problem, but let's, let's, let's tell the story. Okay, so um, I think, um, and I truly believe that, like, our character is a sum total of all of our experiences, and I think... Um, when I look back at when I started my journey in entrepreneurship, which was in 2004, um, so that's now 14, 14 15 years ago, um, I look back, back at all of the things which have made me the complicated, sort of peculiar, quirky person that I am, and I look at a particular period in the time, I call it my dark days, um, which essentially is from 2005 to 2010. So I actually graduated um, from the University of Manchester in 2005, um, did the degree in chemistry, as, as every typical Nigerian mum would, would expect. You know, I was slightly older than, than a lot of people going to university, because uh, I was actually quite late when it came to the education system. So I started university at 22, when most people had left university in the UK by 22. Um, I'm actually the first and only person in my, in my in UK family to have ever attended and gone to university. Um, so I guess for me, it was just like finding out what the, what the new world looked like. Um, so... I had, this, I had this idea that I wanted to do something important. Like, I, I think, as any typical Nigerian is, we are very ambitious, we are very bold, we have these amazing uh, illusions of grandeur for ourselves. Mm. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, and usually we're right. Um, <laughs> so um, so I, I, I wrapped myself in this youthful enthusiasm that I was going to go out there and change the world. Mm. Yes. So... I, after, after graduating in 2005, um, I went through essentially like a catastrophic sort of failure upon failure upon failure upon failure upon failure. And again, just to sort of put that into some context. So Manchester has the largest um, uh, student university population in Europe. Um, there were bouts of time where I was essentially homeless. Now, I could have gone and got a job, but for me, that was like, that was not what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a, a big sort of big man or whatever it was. So... I ended up, um, you know, going from one person's couch to the other. Again, it was kind of cool. As you're, if you're a student in the UK, it's kind of cool to be homeless, that homeless guy. So <laughs> we did that for a little while. Um, we, I had so many challenges with, like, for example, like uh, my my my, my um, landlords. So not having money, being an entrepreneur, means you don't pay bills. Uh, UK is actually really difficult to get you out of the apartment. So our um, our electricity stopped working, and our landlord just refused to do anything about it. So I think we spent three or four months without um, electricity, which is really weird. In Nigeria, it's normal. In, in the UK, it's really, really weird. Um, and again, it's... So Iroko, which most people know me today, which I started in 2010, was the 11th. That's one one, the 11th startup, which I created. Before then, again, was just like a series of, like, really stupid youthful mistakes. And I think being young is really cool. And trust me, being young is, I'm an old man now in my mind. Being young is amazing. Please enjoy it. Because all I want now is to take back 10 years and go back to my younger self, kick him in the ass and be like, do better, be more sensible about it. So for me, it was um, every classic entrepreneurial mistake that you make, I basically made them. So 
usually when you, when, when you start a business, you're supposed to have a business plan. I thought I was too cool for a business plan, so I went out there while I was building, tinkering away, building something. Um, I, built, I spent four months. I, I, I quit my job, which I was sort of doing part-time. I just decided I'm going to hunker down in my room. I'm going to build the most amazing thing. It's going to change the world. Um, it changed nothing, uh, except for my, my poverty levels. Um, and what I found was that I never spoke to the customers. I just built what I thought was cool, and that was that. And I think wisdom now makes you now pick up the phone and speak to people to understand what, what you should do and what you shouldn't do and help guide you in some of your decision-making around the business you're creating. Back then, I was just like, you know what? I know what I'm doing. I'm just like this genius, tinkerer person. And obviously, that was like a rude awakening within four or five months, and all of my uh, savings uh, basically vanished uh, in, the first, in the first instance. Now, um, again, this is something specific to the Nigerian community, uh, but being broke isn't like, isn't like a cool thing. I think being, um, being a student and broke, but being like an actual person who's graduated and being broke, um, you know, a lot of your friends, don't, they stop inviting you places. Um, <laughs> Definitely was not getting many sort of like, when I said, hey, let's go out and have go to the cinema or go for a date, there were a lot of rejections. Um, so I guess it, it really kind of, uh, I guess for me, changed my relationship with, with the outside world in a way. Because obviously over the last, over the five year period, I was just, you know, going from one debacle to another debacle to another debacle to the point where I think the, 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 the craziest thing is uh, she, uh, Jessica, who actually um, helped organize on, on my part, me attending here, um, I didn't have money, I had employees, um, and I couldn't pay them. Now, they had grocery bills, they had rent, they had their lives. I broke that fundamental employee-employer relationship or, or social contract, and I couldn't pay them. Um, so, uh, she's a dear friend of mine now, but she literally walked me to the ATM, to the cash machine, and was like, let me see what balance you have there, whatever you have there. And then this is, again, I'm, I'm a tall, big, proud man. Being walked uh, to the cash machine um, is definitely up there in one of the most uh, humiliating experiences of my life. But now we're great friends, obviously. Um, but, you know, I, I think when I was going through that period, you know, all of my friends were like, Jason, stop. You've tried. Well done. Maybe you should go and get a job. And, you know, I, I would go and get a job for like two or three months. Um, I just feel... I basically feel like I just, I, just, I just didn't fit here. And again, for example, like they'd want you to wear a suit. I like to wear sandals. It was Birkenstock sandals then. Um, so I used to walk around in like sandals all day with a suit on and no tie. And obviously they thought that was, that was crazy. And then I'll just wake up, I'm not going to work. And my, and my mom was just like, what is wrong with you? Again, specifically Nigerian, she felt this was a spiritual attack. Um, <laughs> that, uh, <laughs> that, um, <laughs> That's African, okay. So it sounds very familiar. So we all have people in the village who don't want us to prosper and succeed in life. Um, so she felt that there was one or two uncles in the village who were basically, um, with their remote control, they were basically pulling back my destiny. Um, but she, but she, she cried year after year. She prayed. Um, you know, she, she tried to drag me to different places in order to kind of get spiritual fortification, prayer warriors, like everything, because she felt that she just didn't understand why someone would go to university, do well, and then choose to basically impoverish themselves. So, um, again, I was, because I was young, I had all the enthusiasm in the world. So every time I'd fail, I'd pick myself back up and I said, you know what, this is going to be the one. So when I actually first started the Wako, um, like, no one would give me any money. No one was interested. The only person who actually sort of stepped up was, like, my, my best friend and my, my university roommate at the time. Um, you know, he saw that I was working incredibly hard. And I think one thing that I'm at least able to do is, like, narrow everything down to just throwing hours at things. Like, I'm definitely not the most smartest person in the world. But if it's to outwork, if it's to sort of, like, stay awake for, like, 36, 48 hours, I can stay awake. If it's to work 18 hours a day and, like, block out, like, social life and everything else, like, I can do that. So he kept on, like, you know, giving me money and supporting me. Um, and in the end, over, the, over like a nine month period, he went from giving me like, five, so Iroko was starting with like 500 pounds, he gave me like 500 pounds, to the point where he so believed in me, so believed in like my, my energy, so believed in just like my, my, the way I was hurting myself in order to push this thing forward, he actually ended up liquidating his entire life savings, which at the time was about $200,000, and basically giving it to me. Now again, as you can imagine, um, he's German, 
Uh, Nigerians would not give me any money whatsoever. Um, so he's German, and his friends were like, wait, hold on, let me understand. So you're giving all of your money to a Nigerian guy who's doing Nollywood movies in Nigeria? <laughs> And he's left to go to Nigeria to do this business. Uh, I'm not too sure that's a good idea. Um, so he, again, he he had to he had to like block out all of those sort of negative stereotypes, negative stereotypes. The business didn't work for the longest time. It dawned on us that I had to move back to Nigeria. I told my mom, you know what, like this is the one. It's going to be the big one. She just started bursting out crying that they finally worked. That my my, my enemies have won. Um, uh, so. So you're, you're leaving UK, you're going to Nigeria looking for a brighter future. That one just doesn't, that sounds like regression. So, you know, it's, it was, um, I wouldn't call it I was a social outcast, but I, I didn't have very many friends. Um, I, I, I guess I've got three children now, I've got a boy and two girls. If I, if I was to look back at my experience and ask them, if you truly want to be happy, don't do entrepreneurship. It's probably one of me, the most loneliest like disappointment field, calamity after calamity type thing. Um, and that's me saying that with like, you know, 14 years of wisdom and, wisdom and experience. Um, if you make it, and I think it's really important that like people realize that the vast majority of people I knew who'd started companies, they didn't work out. You know, I, I feel so fortunate that my, my enemies didn't win, that um, at least my mum now can proudly say that ah, that's that's my son, and now everyone's every now she, I, I gave him the idea <laughs> <laughs> that she was the inspiration. Um, but I think f at least at least for me, I I'm always grounded by the fact that for five years, um, everything I touched turned to dust. All of my dreams, all of my ambitions, all of my ego. So. Most people feel I have a really big ego, and I think personally I do, but I'm always humbled by the fact that I'm just like one, I feel like I'm one sort of crazy step away from going back to where I was in the dark days, um, and that definitely kind of keeps me working. So I, I feel that the only reason I'm sitting here is because I was just like self-absorbed, and, and I, I just completely believed that I was to do something interesting, and I just kept on plowing on. So I actually feel that... Um, you will always fail, you will fail at everything. But it's that, that perseverance, that ability to just push through, even push through the pain, push through the, the parents, push through the spiritual attacks, push through everything. Um, we're, all, we're in Africa, so we have to, religion has to be in there. So, um, you know, we, we uh, it's hard. You will 100% fail, you will 1,000% fail. It's what you do in that failure and what lessons you take from that um, is, will determine like, what kind of person you are. And I, I guess just to end, because I, I think I'm just a bit over. Um, when I was broke, I used to sit in my house like on Google. All the amazing things that I would do when I got money. I'll do this, I'll do that. In fact, let me do this, I'll do that. This is the thing I'll buy. The funny thing is, all of those things, now, I, I can afford all of them, but I do none of them. And I, I think it's, it's, it's important to realize that for me, the journey was what important. It's not where I ended up. It was really about the journey. And I, I think I'm, I'm happy that you guys obviously allowed me to be here to share the story. So thank you very much, uh, Obama Foundation, and thank you for having me. Well, I think there's some incredible questions that one can follow up on with that uh, story you've shared with us, Jason. Thank you very much. And I think it's such a powerful and real and authentic representation of the ideals of the Obama Foundation around the ideas of fearlessness and imagination and uh, inspiration and perseverance. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. Patrick Awa, um, the founder and president of Ashesi University, uh, please share your story with us. Well, so thank you very much for the invitation to speak here. And um, let me first say that um, my risk profile is very different than Jason's. <laughs> and it's, it's really amazing to, to listen to, to you and, and what you've done. Um, I'm an introvert, and I, I grew up with this idea that I would become an astronaut or an, an engineer. And, and I became an engineer uh, at Microsoft. It was a good company. Um, it was relatively small when I started, uh, about 3,000 people. And um, it was an incredible eight years that I was there um, with the company taking on 
some pretty big challenges and, and being successful and being part of that. Um, so while I was there, my son was born and uh, his birth came shortly after our incident in Somalia and Rwanda. And the, the, Rwanda, the Rwanda crisis especially caught my attention because the head of my business unit, um, his vice president, um, Mike Murray, uh, sent out this email to the whole company uh, saying he wanted to start a grassroots effort to raise funds to help uh, the situation in Rwanda. And this was not coming from the company, it was coming from Mike. Uh, and it was the first time I'd sort of made a significant contribution to, uh, to a crisis or a problem in the world. Um, up until then, I'd been giving money to my alma mater. But the Rwanda crisis and the birth of my son shortly after was a real wake-up call to me because that's when I started to think, hey, you know, Africa needs to be on a different direct trajectory because the tra trajectory it was on affected people of African descent wherever they were. And I thought that in just the same way that the Asian tiger phenomenon changed the world for Asians everywhere, we needed a similar thing to happen in Africa. And so this was when I started to think, hey, you know, maybe I should leave what I'm doing and go back home and make a contribution of some sort, okay? Uh, and um, I, I went to Ghana and I spoke with lots of people, friends and family, and settled on the idea that a root cause of a lot of, a lot of our issues or an impediment to solutions was the nature of leadership in the country. Uh, so leaders who were accepting the status quo, uh, some leaders who are corrupt, and leaders as defined by anyone in a position of influence, not just the politicians, right? So the civil service and, um, you know, anyone who could move the needle but who wasn't doing so. And I settled on this idea that th those leaders were among the 5% at the time of their age group who got a college education. So in the late 1990s, between two and five percent of people aged 18 to 25 would get a post-secondary education in Ghana. So almost by definition, the people in college were the people who were gonna run the country fast forward 20, 30 years. And so I got this idea that what we needed was a movement that would completely change higher education in Africa. Um, not just a university, but a movement to change all the universities. And that to do that, I needed to actually set one up, a model that would sort of be this very bright beacon that would you know, beckon other universities to change their path, to focus more on ethics, to focus more on innovation, to, um, to educate people to be as risk-taking as Jason over here. Um, and then I bulked, um, and it took me a year and a half I, after I had the full permission of my wife to quit the company <laughs> before I did. And you know, she, she, you know, the day I asked her, you know, I woke up one morning and I asked her, what would you say if I said, I'm gonna leave Microsoft today, let's go to Ghana, let's do education. And she immediately said yes. And, and then I sat up and I said, wait, don't you think we should think about this a little bit? And, and, and so I balked. But, but the, the, reason, the reason, I asked myself why I was delaying, and the reason was just a fear of failure. That was it. And so um, I decided that what I needed to do was to manage that, that fear. And so I went to business school. I learned how organizations work. I decided to find a co-founder, somebody who would get on this journey with me. Um, and then I also sort of put out probes to my colleagues um, at Microsoft and, and said, you know, I'm gonna go off and start this university um, and waited to see what would happen. Uh, so why was I doing all of those things? 
To me, the entrepreneurial journey is like going to climb a mountain. And if you, if you decide you want to go climb Mount Everest and you want to survive, <laughs> um, you better find a buddy to go on the journey with you who's going to train with you. You'll gather the resources, prepare yourself. Um, you'd build yourself up and then go to the mountain and then you'd find a Sherpa to guide you up. And as you're going up, with, when there's storms, you'd pause and zip up the tent and hunker down. And then when the storm is over, you'd come out and keep climbing, right? And, and so that's what I was trying to do, is you know, find a buddy, get the resources together, prepare myself, get, get some guides. And I, you know, I built a board of people who would guide me on this journey. Uh, I would say that the, the success of what I'm doing now is because of those steps that I took. Um, but also because I, I did, in fact, overcome my failure, my fear of failure. We have come close to failure at times, you know, when we've had cash flow issues, especially in the early, early days, when we've had, you know, big differences with the accreditation system in Ghana. And all of those times, it was that network of people around me who were working with me on this project that helped us navigate and get back on, on the right path. And so th the way I look at entrepreneurship is I think that the, the most important pitch that you make is can you actually find one person who's willing to come along with you? Like Jason found someone, <laughs> right? The German guy. Can you find one person if you can't find one person, go find them. The second thing is that all relationships matter. Um, and I make it a point to nurture good relationships, both professionally and, and at home. Uh, because those relationships and those people are the people that help you get through this project that, that, that you're doing. Uh, and then the, the other thing I would like to just say is that there will come times when you're kind of down on your knees. And by the way, don't laugh at the prayers of your mother. <laughs> okay, my mother prayed a lot too. Um, and, and I value it greatly. Um, but there will, there will come those moments when things are very difficult um, and you just have to get up and keep walking. And then finally, there's, you know, I feel like I'm still learning. Um, wh where, where we are now is I feel like, yes, we've been able to build a strong university in Ghana, but my original goal was to start a movement on the continent. I still need to engage that. You know, we built the light and it's shining, but, but until we've seen that movement, because there's millions of kids, millions of students now in African universities. And they will be educated in a way to either be a force for good or a force for ill. And if we're able to have this movement, then we get millions of people to be educated differently and we'll see a very different future for the continent. So now that part of my mission, <laughs> I'm just setting off on that, setting off on that one. So, um, getting out of my comfort zone again. Uh, hopefully, if we're lucky, if we're successful, we will be able to um, encourage other universities to become fierce competitors to us, to keep us honest, um, and really to change the world. Great story. Thank you so much, Patrick. A wonderful story. I'm going to stay with you um, and 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 begin our, our, our Q&A session with you. Um, it's so much easier, especially once you've had very visible success as you have. Um, I'm sure the audience is aware of the, the, the awards that you've received, the Order of the Volta, uh, which is one of Ga uh, Ghana's um, highest awards. It, it's very easy as an entrepreneur, once you've seen that kind of very visible and fulfilling success, to not have that drive and push for the next goal yet it's quite clear in your mind that this is not it yet. And I, I, I know that and I feel it as an entrepreneur. I'm, I'm often asked, why don't you write a book about your life and what you've done? And 
deep down, I always say, I haven't even started. I mean, I, I know where I want to go, and this is really a rehearsal. Um, one I appreciate, but I know that the real deal is still um, ahead of me. Um, how do you, what inspires you to, to still push when you've had such incredible success? Well, I think you've, you've got the answer. I mean, this is just the beginning, first of all. But um, the success of Ashesi University is not just Patrick's doing. The success is a success of a lot of people. And so I, have, I am under no illusion that this is just about just my effort. It has taken lots of people. And so when I get those awards, I give credit to all those people. Uh, th the second thing is that, you know, if you set a big enough goal and you remain committed to that big enough goal, then all of these things are just sort of milestones on the way to achieving that. Um, so it's good, it's good to have those milestones and to look and say, okay, we, we achieved some measure of success and that's good, it tells you you're on the right path. But, but, but if you set a high enough goal, then you know that there's still a lot, a lot of work to be done. You've also spoken about the, the challenges that one meets along the way, and you've mentioned the, the challenges you've had, um, cash flow challenges or accreditation and you know, sort of right. regulatory challenges that you've had um, in Ghana. Um, what are the, some of the qualities that you believe equip one to fail forward, to, to, to actually benefit from challenges or to benefit from failure? How have you done that? For me, it's been quite simple. When we've had major challenges, uh, our second year, we, I came within two weeks of running out of cash. And, you know, at that time, I, I positioned my office next to the student cafeteria. So I could see my students every day, and I had my windows, the, the windows were open all the time, no, the blinds were open, so they could see and I could see out. And for me, just watching those students was incredibly energizing. There's just no way you give up easily when you're holding the lives of these students in your hands, right? Um, and Today, you know, I'm, you know, I see our alumni and the work that they're doing and the success that they're achieving. And that is also a reminder that, you know, what we put up with, you know, 15 years ago, 14 years ago, and got through that resulted in this, let's keep going. So for me, that's really my North Star, is how well are my students doing how well am I doing for my students and the alumni? Your story of um, sort of putting your students there in front of you to, to see them every day and, and it energizing you almost resonates in a way with um, your story, Jason, of Googling the things you'd buy um, when you were successful. <laughs> um, very different, but um, what I'm getting at is just this idea of imagination, this idea of of, of visualization, visualizing your goal in some way. Um, is that something you've actively done, Jason? Yeah, absolutely. Just, just a quick question. Who's an Iroko TV subscriber here? Just a quick question. Iroko TV, Iroko subscriber. TV subscribers in the house? Look, we move subscribers everywhere. That's what I see. <laughs> <laughs> so, again, I think um, we, like, everywhere I go, every room I'm in, I see people who are not part of our community. Um, there's a small price to be part of our community, but it's small. Um, no, I think there are, there, are, um, there are tens, if not hundreds of millions of people who love like Nigerian content, love what Nigeria represents. There are barriers in order for them to be able to like access and, and, and obviously enjoy that content. So what, what we try to do essentially is you know, while, while the whole world is going higher quality, uh, streaming, different types of, um, like, uh, sort of HD, 4K, all the rest of that stuff, we're kind of breaking it down, well, how can a person who doesn't really know how to use the Android device, how can they actually use that device? How can someone use a device um, if they don't have constant electricity? 
you know, how can we make our, our app, for example, so simple that you don't even have to be able to read to use it? So again, we're, we spend a lot of time um, with our customers, speaking to them on a, on a constant basis, just trying to understand like what, what their perspective is. And the, the more and more and more we, um, we, uh, we, we, we understand that, the more and more we realize how it's, it's such a, an early step. So again, earlier before, um, you know, we were talking about, well, how big does Iraq get? Mm-hmm. And, and I, I think for us, it's people love Nigerian content, but a lot of people don't really understand the Nigerian American accent that we have in our movies. Um, one of the biggest barriers to break is, to, for example, you take an entire library and you dub it into Swahili. You've now opened up to 130 or 40 million people um, content which they otherwise may not or may, 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 may be able to access. Again, we, we did the same in, uh, in, in French speaking in Africa and France. We dubbed a whole bunch of content, people fell in love with it. Um, Angola, Mozambique, you're dubbing in Portuguese, people fall in love with it. So I, I kind of feel that the, the number one barrier to most people is language. Mm-hmm. And I think as a company, if we can try to remove those pretty massive barriers, um, then again, more and more people will, will come into our community. And I, I guess for me, I've, I've always been very sort of public and honest about how long this journey will be. Um, it's, it's a multi-decade type journey. We're, we're sort of seven or eight years in now. And if I'm like 50, 60, still running a company, I think, then obviously that's, that's the blessings of God, right? So. What's the big vision for you? What, what will mean ultimate success for you as far as Iroko is concerned? To be frank, I, 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 never, so I never believed I would be this successful. Mm-hmm. Even, even yeah. in my, even, even what I was Googling <laughs> then and what I can do now, is, and they're two very different things. So for me, it was like I get a nice car, a nice watch, maybe one small apartment somewhere for me. I've succeeded, kind of thing. Again, very materialistic in the Nigerian sense. Um, but for me, it's like it's, you know, everyone tells me that I knew you'd be successful, I knew you'd do a great job, oh my God, it's amazing. I didn't know I'd be successful. I actually think I'm probably the most fortunate person that I, I know. I kind of feel that someday I'm gonna be found out and people are like, this guy should not be there. Should not be running a company of 500 people, like how did he get there? So um, it's like, my vision isn't like, I'm going to do this and that's what it's going to be. I, I'm not that kind of imaginative person. All I know is that whatever we were doing last year, we want to do it better this year. And whatever we're doing this year, we want to do it better next year. And we're going to keep on... So it's more incremental. It's more tactical. Yeah. Some people are big strategic thinkers. They want to like create this and do that. And you know, these guys are like deep analytical strategic thinkers and creative <laughs> movements. Me, I just wanted to bring some more money and pay for my rocket to be subscription share. <laughs> At least if we can, if if we can, if we can start there and then yeah. hey, when, when I move forward. Yeah. So. <laughs> but you, I mean, it's, I'm I'm still trying to digest the fact that you say you failed at almost 11 startups. Yeah, Ten. Right? Ten. What made you get up the 11th time? So. So I've never actually had a job before, like a proper job before. <laughs> So I would either get fired or I would just leave within a few months. And I, I kind of realized that like, I'm just fundamentally like, unemployable, I think. Um, I, I find that, and, and we were talking about this earlier on, like, I'm such a, I've kind of built myself this little weird world and I, I enjoy it and I'm very sort of like simple to kind of follow that path. Um, so f- for me, it was really about, um, no one's gonna employ me because I'm just not gonna listen to them because I, I don't know how to listen to people. Um, and I kind of felt that, I felt free whenever I was doing what I was doing, for example. And, and, and just, again, to give you a perfect example. So there's 500 people in Iwako. I don't read emails. I have no interest in reading emails. I pretty much run the entire company via WhatsApp and Slack. Um, I, don't, I hate meetings, so I don't have meetings. So if you look at my schedule this week, um, I have no meetings in there. If you want to meet or have a conversation, it must be, right there, right then, complete like fluidity. That's not the way you build a company. That's not how they'll teach you at Harvard or Stanford. But it's, it's the only way I can operate. So um, you were like, should we have lunch tomorrow? I said, yes, because I have nothing in my diary tomorrow. I get up, I open my laptop, I start working, I'm firing out WhatsApp messages to everybody. So I've kind of built my own world and I, I like it. Um, so I, I, I guess looking back, what, 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 whatever I was doing then, I was doing it on my own terms. Even if I was, and not even, when I was dirt poor, at least it, I chose to be dirt poor. It was like my decision. 
there. So, like, just having that, I think being an entrepreneur, you have to have a degree of control. If you don't have the control, then essentially you don't have the burden and you're not like a, a full entrepreneur. And I think any, any, when you're talking about almost running out of money, if I tell you the stories of me running out of money, and, and I, I think, let me give you a perfect example. So in the UK, someone was going to push me into bankruptcy. They called me up in the morning, like 8 a.m. Jason, you're not paying your bills. I'm going to basically put you into bankruptcy. And there was nothing I could do. I jumped in that car. I drove like 400 miles from like Manchester to Aberystwyth, which is like uh, uh, Wales. They, I turned up at like 4 o'clock in the afternoon. like, what the hell are you doing here? I begged them, please, I'm trying. At least you can see that my energy, that I'm, I'm not trying to like, you know, disappear. I'm, I'm here. I'm committed to paying the bills, but I don't have any money. If we can find a way to get around me not having any money, then we can see how we can figure this piece out. But again, like, that's a crazy thing to do. And because I was that crazy and I was that sort of like remove the ego, accept the humiliation, they took me out for dinner. They paid for my hotel. I was going to sleep in a car, so they paid for my hotel. They were like, that guy's crazy, but at least he cares and he, he at least has a commitment to pay his bills. Um, you say that it's, it was fearlessness as well? I, I, so I think one, I think anyone who can do extreme things out of the norm has to have some sort of borderline personality disorder. You have to be pretty crazy to do anything. If I woke up one day and told my wife that I want to leave Iwako and go to Rwanda to South University, first again, she'll pray for me. That, that dream that you have. <laughs> that voice is your hearing. I've come again. So, <laughs> so, like, it's having someone who can support you, like, absolutely, I think is super important. Um, but, like, my wife knows my crazy, and she knows the degrees of my crazy. Um, I believe your wife would most definitely know you're crazy, and your, your partner, the person who's closest, they know you're crazy, mm -hmm. and they just try to maneuver yeah. <laughs> and manage it. I don't actually see that as crazy at all. I don't see this crazy yeah. at all. I, you know, you're telling that story, and what I what I heard was authenticity. You're you're who you are, and you show up as yeah. Jason. You're not somebody else, right? Yes. And, and, and it's also a relationship. So you, you have that relationship with that person. You, you drove 400 miles to yeah. be in front of them and be honest and authentic. It's not crazy at all. And it's not necessarily unique. I mean, as Jason is telling his story, and I'm sure you, you find that as well, that there are elements you can identify with. Yeah. He just has a Jason way of delivering them, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, but the other thing that you do do, Jason, before we get to, um, to Bina, um, and I know you tend to talk down your, your, your deep work, so to speak, but you, you have a company, Spark, or you're a co-founder of Spark, which invests in tech companies. And we were talking earlier, just before the panel started, around the difficulty, particularly in Africa, and you said that as well, that you had a German um, investor who, who believed in your project, but just the difficulty for entrepreneurs and any visionaries, really, to find funding from Africans in Africa. Could you talk a bit about that and, and how that perhaps inspired Spark? Yeah, so I think um, Iroko was such a rapid success. So for the first nine or ten months, it wasn't working. But then when it worked, within from like November through to like June, July, we went from like me in my house trying to figure stuff out to like making sixty, seventy thousand dollars a month and just being like, what do I do with all this money? Let me just keep on investing in the business. So it was such a rapid success that I saw that if you if you, I don't want to use an Nigerian word, if you hammer, it works, it works. Um, and I kind of felt that this is Nigeria 2010, and young people weren't given opportunities. And when I, when I first moved to Lagos, I've never met my father before. I'm not part of any well-known family. I definitely didn't have any money. I lived out of the, the main sort of like the triangle of wealth, which is VI, Ikoi, Lekki, those areas. I chose to live like far away, but near, but near to the business. So I remember speaking to people at the beginning, the way they shunned me, the way they were like, who's your father? We don't know who this guy is. You know, you didn't go to Harvard. You're not, you're not a serious person. And you're doing Nollywood entertainment. Ah. So I felt that if I can come to Nigeria, essentially, as a complete, like, alien. So you hear my voice. I've been in Nigeria eight years. I'm, my voice hasn't changed. I don't speak Pidgin. I don't speak any of the local languages or, or anything. But if I was able to come in and be 
so, so successful so quickly, I kind of felt that there must be other opportunities in, in areas around technology where they can be, they're being completely overlooked. And I kind of felt that there, at a time, again, there were good universities um, where you know, technical founders were coming out, but they weren't being given the capital. So um, again, for example, like, um, and this is, what, this is what created Spark. So the angel investors in Iroko uh, gave 50,000 pounds. I never met them, I never spoke to them. Spoke to them, they were the bosses of uh, Bastian, my, my, my German friend, co-founder. So they, they didn't get to speak to me, they, they gave him the money because it was him and he was putting his own money. So in 2013, um, some new investors wanted to buy their stake for like a couple of million dollars. And I was just like, okay, so you can actually make money in this, in this internet thing. So um, Bastian and I went back to um, some of our, again, then high net worth friends. We raised two and a half million dollars, and our view was very simple: like, let's break that into fifty to two hundred fifty thousand dollar checks, and let's give young guys in Nigeria the opportunity to to build these companies. And I think going back to two thousand and thirteen, it definitely wasn't the norm. It was it was a pretty, uh, I guess, somewhat extreme thing to do then. Um, but you know, Hotels.ng and Mark Essien has become like one of the one of the foremost Nigerian entrepreneurs. He just did an, inter, uh, an internship program for 4,000 software developers in Lagos. Again, we're the first money into that. To let, we gave them a quarter of a million dollars. Again, they're now, they went on to raise like a couple of million dollars, now employ like 60, 70 people. So there was this shift in Nigeria where you didn't have to be a big politician or big man's son to get investors, where it's actually not a big deal for like a small group of young Nigerians in, in, in Yaba somewhere to get a couple of million dollars in venture capital or go to like Y Combinator. So just that dramatic shift over the last eight years, I think is definitely put a huge amount of, of power and, and, um, and the, the chance of entrepreneurship um, into, uh, uh, into the hands of young people. And I think, you know, in Nigeria, when I first came, they told me that everyone needs a chairman. You need a chairman who's gonna support you, push things forward. But this is technology, there is no chairman. The German is too busy doing property and oil and gas, doesn't understand anything. So in the end, they, they, we've been able to build, and it's definitely in Nigeria, we've been able to build an ecosystem of people who can build things their own way, um, can build things much more kind of San Francisco, um, kind of LA startup way than you would in a particular type of way in Nigeria. And again, the huge amount of money which has gone into Nigerian startups over the last like five or six years, I think is testament to the fact that, you know, even if the the politicians and the, and the chairman and the, and the old money don't believe in us, then there are people sitting in London, in Europe, in, in, in the US who can definitely believe in us and, and, and build big companies. It's diversifying the, the FDI that uh, is, is coming into Nigeria and creating a, a different locus of power from, from the political one. But uh, staying with politics, Bina, um, your, your journey in the political arena, so you started off seeking out a political seat um, and then eventually achieved your political goals and aims through starting Badili Africa. Do you still have the ambition to go the traditional route in terms of politics? Um, in terms of getting back to the race? Yes. Uh, I think it's a bit tricky. Uh, it's a bit tricky right now because we just came from an election um, last year. But um, I'm, I'm happy listening to both Jason, uh, both Jason and um, Awa here. But then, you know, the civic terrain is um, is a bit is a bit different. And unlike entrepreneurship, like the change is never instant at times. You know, the change uh, the change takes time. And for me, when we talk about what you mentioned earlier, you know, about the power of, the power of imagination. And, um, and fearlessness, uh, for me, that is going forward, it's in this civic space, how do we build bridges of commonality? Because most of the time in, in, the, you know, in this civic space, what we try to do is to shame people into changing, is to shame people into believing in the things that we believe, such that, so if you supported, you know, if you supported this person, then shame on you. How could you not see that this is the right person? So if you don't believe in this particular thing and I believe in this particular thing, it's shame on you. So it's how then do we get to a point where we sit back and think, what lens are you using? to look at things this way, 
why is it that you look at things this way? And then how do we come to this particular place? How do we, how do we meet at the bridge so we can go forward? And I think that's the kind of work that I've been uh, trying to engage in, in terms of active participation of uh, citizens at the community level, working with... For to effect that active participation. So um, I'll talk about um, a program for young women. So during the campaigns, I realized that a lot of young women between 18 and 27 years old were not interested in showing up for the rallies, you know, um, especially the elite young women. I'm, I'm saying elite because these are, you know, young women who are, in, let's say, in campus, uh, and not the ones that are at the community, basically, but young women who are out there. And they would not show up for forums. They would not engage even online. Uh, and even some of them who are very, my very close friends would not even tweet about a political issue. And at times, even just following their profile, you'd see they're not following even other politicians. I mean, even other, other women who are leaders uh, in my own country. And I think that took me back uh, after the election just to analyze, so how do I reach out to these young women? And that's when me and uh, some two other ladies, we began Political Spas. So Political Spas, what it does basically is to merge beauty and uh, politics. So we call it Political Spas because we merge makeup artistry and actually politics. So it's like a glam up session because then most many young women are able, many young women are able to even tell their parents, tell their, you know, tell their partners, I'm going for a glam up session because it was quite a challenge for them to say, I'm going for a political meeting, especially if your parents are not into politics, they don't like politics. That was quite a challenge for them to just announce, you know, this is where I'm going because someone might assume, oh, you're so, you're supporting that side, oh, it can get chaotic. So that is one of the platform uh, that we are using. And then when it comes to women, uh, we are using uh, self-help groups to reach out to them. So locally, we call them chamas. I don't know what you call them in SA. But uh, these are self-help groups for these particular women. And the idea is not to, you know, to create new groups, but to leverage on what already exists. Because with self-help groups, these women will still meet whether you're there or not, you know, whether you have an agenda, an agenda with them or not. So it's how to infiltrate that space and uh, uh, teach them and make them realize the power they have because they are already organized, you know, at any given point, any woman is in a self-help group at the community level. So it's how do they then claim their power? Yes, pretty much. Wonderful, thank you. So we're just on 22 minutes um, uh, left for our discussion. And so we'd like to spend the rest of that time engaging the audience and getting some questions from you. And I already see a question, I think the lady in the black jacket, uh, second from the end of the row there. Please just say your name and who you are, um, and then ask your question. Okay, my name, my name is Pamela Adie. I am an LGBT rights activist from Nigeria. My question is to Jason, but I guess it can also apply to, um, to the rest of the uh, speakers. So Jason, you have a big um, TV, uh, sorry, film distribution company. I know that your wife is also a filmmaker. And I know that in, in Nigeria, uh, most Nigerian media houses will not or may not, uh, you know, want to broadcast or distribute LGBT related content. Um, but the, the truth is that we, we do need that to sort of change culture and to, you know, um, sort of push tolerance and acceptance. So my question is, how can you use your empire um, to sort of contribute to changing attitudes um, towards tolerance and acceptance of LGBT people in Nigeria? Great question. So I think what's great about Iwoko is that um, it's, it's not grounded in Nigeria, essentially. So a lot of media houses in Nigeria may be... Um, whether regulatory or, or whatever other reason, politically may not be willing to, to broadcast um, stuff. Iroko has offices in like five or six different countries. Um, we broadcast out of London, for example. So the channels that you guys see here on DHTV, we broadcast them out of, um, out of London. Um, we, we obviously have reach in, uh, in the UK, North America, etc. So obviously our ability to reach people and take whatever message we want to take we don't have any sort of like um, sort of shackles or, or challenges around that. 
I think the, the big sort of caveat is that essentially I, I work for my wife. She creates all of the content. I just figure out how to commercialize it. So um, I, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not a creative person. I, I've never read a script in my life. It's something where we, like, as, a, as an organization, I, I think we are, we're humble enough to allow the creators to be creative. Um, I, I would feel that if there was a, um, and, and we've, we've tackled some pretty, uh, you know, sensitive issues um, in, 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 in the recent past. So, for example, child not bride. So we dealt with, like, child marriages. We've dealt with other type of things. Um, I definitely feel we've done something in, um, uh, um, in, 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 in across all spheres. Um, if there is a, so I guess for, for me, it's, if the story is sweet and my market will sell, <laughs> then, it can, then it can flow. That's not a problem. I think the key thing is that, especially to the, to the most people who watch the channels and the content that we have, they want to escape from the reality of what they're living in the moment. So if you, can, if you can package that in a way which is just like really sweet and really exciting, and you have the messages in there, no problem. At least for us, we have no problems with that whatsoever. And I guess just to put into context, um, there, was, there was a new group, I think it's Mental Awareness. So they, they were sort of calling me out on Twitter that you had a movie, the way you dealt with the mental aspect of it just didn't make any sense. This is just like such a backwards way. Offline, I said, you know what? Like, we're happy to engage. You obviously know more about this and you're definitely more passionate about this than us who are just trying to make a story. So now my wife, anytime any of her scripts has any type of uh, mental awareness, um, issue around like depression or you know po postpartum um, you know pregnancy depression and stuff like that. We just kick the question and the section to uh, to, to to the te that that team um, with the view that if you guys can give us some guidance, as long as it doesn't change the entire story, but if you can give us some guidance, we're happy to kind of include that. So I guess it's a question of um, that engagement, and I, I don't think anyone's ever reached out to us, at least definitely not to me specifically, and said, you know what, Jason, you should be doing this, because I'm, I'm, I'm always online, so I'd be happy to, to engage on that. Great. Lady in front. Um, hi, guys. My name is Tinoda. I am from Zimbabwe. Um, I work with uh, students in marginalized areas, uh, ranging from 16 to 18, helping them, especially when it comes to information uh, dissemination with regards to opportunities. So as I engage with them, they ask me a question which I would like to direct to Jason so that I can give them feedback. Um, there's this scenario that at times you have got talents as an individual, and then there's a clash between what you want to do and what your parents expect you to do. So what would you advise, given such a situation, considering that these uh, students are be between 16 and 18, they're considered minors, but at the same time, there's that clash uh, with culture that you have to do what your parents do, but you have your own vision as a person. So I think you should do what your parent tells you to do. <laughs> um, no, so I look, for example, our policy is anyone under the age of 18, they must bring their parent. I think when you're dealing with like young, fertile miles, you have to be very, very, very careful that you don't, you know, again, send them in off in the wrong direction. I feel that, um, I think most parents are like normal people. If you're, if, if you're, well, most parents are normal. Um, if you're dedicated, you know, some people are like, I must act, and that's it. If it's, if it's that extreme, then I, I, I would have the parents hold them tight. But I think if it's a question of, and we see this a lot, Loads of people feel that they have talent. Loads of people want to pursue um, acting and entertainment as a career choice. Again, the vast majority of people will not succeed. It's just a question of numbers. But I do feel that if you have, if you are a great student, you're respectful to your parents. If you, most parents, I believe, if you like, if you work really hard and you're a serious and studious individual at that 16 to 18 year old, if you express an interest in doing something. Um, in entertainment or in, or, or in acting or in music, I think most parents will at least support you. It might not be going to like auditions like every week, but I think on the odd occasion, I think every parent wants to, um, every parent wants to, uh, to, to support their children. And I think what's really happened definitely over the last sort of 10 years, so when my, when my wife's been acting now, for, or she's been in the entertainment industry for like 16 or 17 years, no one supported her back in 2000 and five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, when, when you were an actor, well, you weren't a serious thing. Now, like, the parents and the people who are in the entertainment industry are seen as, like, the visible success. 
if you want to see young, successful people in Africa, they're most likely going to be somehow into entertainment. Um, and, and I guess just, just to extrapolate, the success is visible. You know, we like to see... We like to see that, you sh that things, are, things are moving, right? So um, I think a lot of parents have changed their attitude um, around being in entertainment. So I, I kind of feel that as long as they are studious, as long as they are very serious in everything else that they do, that most parents or hopefully most frameworks will allow them to actually pursue those dreams. And, and worst case scenario, like they're 16. Wait till like 18, 19, they can do what you want. Time. I'm going to go to this side of the audience. Um, the gentleman in the second row with the blue shirt. Pause my question to Patrick. Uh, you mentioned the transition that you made from Microsoft to starting up your own university. And I just wanted maybe if you could shed more light on how you actually handled that whole transition because it was a major shift from engineering to education because I think a lot of, okay, I speak for myself. I mean, I'm mean, about to make a transition and I'm asking myself, am I making the right choice? Is it the right thing or I'm just shooting myself in the foot? So one of the major markers, especially if you are, say, a, a young in your career, but you're thinking of making a major transition, a major shift, what are the markers that you should look out for? So, uh, as I said, one of the things that I did was I went to s learn as much as I could about what I was going to do and built a team around me. Uh, but, you know, when we started, um, my wife and I, and I agreed that one of us would have to have a real job. Um, and so she had the real job, and I was the one who was off doing something else. Uh, so, you know, so, so that, was, that was important. In terms of the, the transition of the family, we, um, you know, family was in Seattle. I was going back and forth between Seattle and Accra for a couple of years. And, um, you know, every month, you know, I was back and forth. Uh, we, just, we just had to live that way. Um, we had to think about how we're going to transition our kids uh, into Ghana and all of that. Uh, so... Long story short, one person is sort of holding the fort at home and the other is taking the risk. That worked well for us. Um, and, you know, just prepare as much as you can. But in any entrepreneurial journey, what I, you know, I found is, first of all, no business plan survives contact with the market. Um, so in spite of all the planning that you're going to do, you're going to encounter differences, unexpected things, and you just have to keep moving, and you just have to keep problem solving along the way. Um, and if you work hard, um, as hard as you're working now, doing on your new enterprise, there's a very high chance that you're going to be fine. Yes, indeed. Um, the gentleman in front with the white shirt. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Atem Ernest. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur from Cameroon. Uh, first of all, if I didn't get the ch this chance, it would be bad. Okay, my first question is to Jason. Um, I kind of like never have known the guy behind um, Iroko, because a couple of times I sponsored a lot of movies that wanted to put it on your platform. Okay, as, as an entrepreneur, just like uh, Blackberry sold out Kodak, went out of business, what are the things, uh, you've, if you have actually really identified the kind of things that will maybe in future put you out of business, um, and how are you working towards preventing that from happening? Because I see how, um, you've been able to scale up to, to, to other countries and bring in new models. My second question, I'm just gonna finish my questions. And my second question, please, because we, we have eight minutes and we'd like to cover... For him. Um, okay. <laughs> but I guess it also works for both of them. You work with your, with your partners, your wife. Um, how does that happen? Because you have the vision, you have the vision, and your wife, uh, please, thank you. So, um, I guess let me start. I think, firstly... Um, so I met my wife when, oh, she was my girlfriend then, but I met her when there was 
four employees at Iwoko. And like, again, during the dark days, it was, you know when you're like starved of people who believe in you? Like for that period of time, so few people like believed in me then. So I met my wife on like Wednesday. By like Saturday, I was like, I love you. We're going to spend the rest of our lives together. She was like, <laughs> she thought I was crazy. She was like, this guy is just crazy. But I was like, I found someone who just like believed in me. And I think it's, if you don't have someone in your life who just believes in you and gives you that like, that support, that whatever's going to happen, it's us, we're going to be okay. Anything which happens, if Rocco fails tomorrow, do you know what, we're, we're going to be okay, we'll figure it out. Because I have that at home, me, I can do anything outside. Because when I, when I come home, my wife loves me, my children love me, everything else for me is vanity. So I think just having that support network, I think it's almost impossible to build something if your wife or your husband is at home trying to fight you. It's, you, it's not possible. <laughs> so I think first, you have to find a right partner. How you do that is not the debate of this, of this panel. Um, and, 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 and to answer your question, it's um, the number one thing which concerns me is if Nollywood becomes less popular. Like, if Nollywood becomes less popular, then everything I've built starts to crumble. And I think, as I mentioned before, I work for my wife because I've literally handed over the keys of my future, my vision, everything, to her to go out there and create. I'm not a creative person. I know that. Whatever she gives me, I can go out there and figure out how to sell it to someone. But I think a creative is a creative is a creative. And, and her spirit is very much that, you know what, there's creative people everywhere. And she's, and I guess rock and their spirit has always been about finding new talent, giving them a chance, empowering them, and just letting them be creative. And I think that is the reason why like Iwoko and especially Rock. Like the crazy thing is I've been building Iwoko for the last eight years. My wife launched these channels 18 months ago on DSTV and GoTV. They are by far more popular than the little business I've been toiling away for the last eight years. <laughs> but I'm okay. It's family business. We'll know how we organize that at home. <laughs> so um, I think you need that hard, hardcore, extreme support at home. And two, it's like it's if Nollywood becomes less popular, then that's my fault. I have the resources, I have the money, I have enough time now and enough wisdom and experience to not let it become less popular. So it's really about investing in new talent, investing in young people, giving everyone an opportunity, embracing all aspects of, of, of storytelling and filmmaking, even if I'm not the creative person, and letting it go. Patrick? So, so my answer is actually very similar. My wife used to work at Microsoft as well, and we met at a party that someone in her team had done. And I met her, and she's the first person I met at the party, and we spent the whole night together. We just didn't stop talking. <laughs> and it was, it was this strange thing where there's this, we just agreed about the things she, she, that mattered to her mattered to me, and vice versa. Um, and so there's just sort of that really strong bond from day one, and I'm not kidding. I, you know, I called my brother the next day and said, I, I think I found the one. And, it's, and it was just one night. It was just totally crazy and kind of corny, but, <laughs> but that's what happened. Um, so, so, we, so we care about a lot of the same things, which is super helpful. If I may answer the question about what, what could get you in trouble is, you have to be very clear about who your customers are, and you have to be very obsessive about meeting the needs of your customers and exceeding the needs of your customers. If your customer site starts to move and you don't move with them, that's when it becomes an existential problem, right? So if you look at Nokia or Kodak or any of those, the customers started to move, and they didn't move along. So I would say to Jason, if they stop loving Nollywood, Move with them. Uh, if, if there's a shift happening in your customer base, you have to pay attention. Right. Wow. <laughs> so let's go to the back. The lady at the back with the white uh, top. Hello, my name is Akosia Hansen. I'm a feminist activist from Ghana. Um, and I've actually run sex ed workshops at a Chessy called Let's Talk Consent. So it's great to meet you from here, Patrick. Uh, this question actually goes to Bina. I wanted to ask um, about uh, women in political participation. Often you find that 
the biggest challenge is not even women themselves today, but is the culture of patriarchy around them, where when you run uh, for any political offices, the first question is, do you have a family? Is your husband behind you? Um, all these things, even going to LGBT, can, can an LGBT person represent themselves as a political candidate and be safe? And I wanted to know, apart from helping women, what, what other things are we doing to change the men and women and culture of, let me, I can see a woman running, I can see an LGBT person publicly declaring that I'm this and I'm running this and not feel like, ugh, you know, um, I wanted to know what other work is being done around that, the culture of around that. Thanks. Um, so that's quite true, um, that the, the, the patriarchy is so entrenched. But currently, with the work that I'm doing and even with the organization that I actually work for, we've begun inviting men to the same spaces where we are inviting women so that we can start having these kind of conversations um, regarding these beliefs that they have and how then do we go beyond that. So for instance, with the self-help groups that I was talking about, um, when recently when we had meetings with them about active participation, we allowed them to bring their partners on board. In fact, we told the women leaders, you know what, if you're coming to this particular, if you're coming to this particular space, uh, come with your significant other, and if you have like a son, please invite them to this particular space. Because then if we actually invite men to um, the space that to the space that we are in, then we are able to understand what frames their thoughts, how are they looking at things. And we had interviews actually after the sessions that we had, and it was quite interesting just listening to what they were saying and uh, listening to their experiences, some of them saying, you know what, I cannot actually allow my wife to be in this particular space because I feel like when she gets to this particular space, her attitude changes. I cannot allow, you know, I cannot submit before a woman who is a leader uh, in this particular, you know, who's a leader or who's a politician. Uh, and some of them were giving, let's say, uh, personal, I mean, personal examples, and uh, maybe their relatives uh, who are in power. And what was interesting was just the, just the exchange between the women who were in that particular space, uh, talking to these men who were their significant other and enabling them and helping them understand the importance of actually diversity and helping them see why diversity is important and that if we both, you know, if we both contribute to decision making, then we have a better space. I don't know if that addresses it. So that is what we're trying to do. And when it comes to campus, that is the same thing we are doing in, uh, that's the same thing we are doing uh, in campus. We are not mentoring girls alone, but we are mentoring both girls and men. Uh, we're mentoring both girls uh, and men at the same time. So we are doing campus program, we are doing uh, the community program that I'm telling you about, and we're looking into going into secondary schools as well, and just picking both genders, uh, taking both genders on board. So ensuring that no no young boy or man is left behind as you yes, as you empower women to that be they understand diversity at, at a tender age, you know, and why it is actually uh, important, and not just have to create these illusions that oh this is happening or if that happens it will affect me this way, but just to begin having candid conversation. Why do you fear women in leadership? What does that mean to you? How do you look at this issue? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to have to end our discussion there. I know there's still many hands up, um, but our panelists will be available um, briefly after this for, for discussion and uh, further questions that you might have. Um, Jason, Bina, Patrick, thank you so much for sharing with us your courageous dreams, your perseverance. Thank you.